Did you enjoy yourselves out in that room with all those beautiful young people? Come on in, beautiful young people. Come on in. <laughs> That's it. All of you. I know we got quite the crew, right? Yeah. These are my students, and they're a wonderful team of people. They give me a lot of hope for the future of our world, really. Because when I work with young people like this, I understand that we can solve a lot of the problems that we have right now. And I'm hoping they help us solve them in the future. And if you're young and you're in these seats right now and you go out, happen to come to Rutgers University in the future, I plan to still be here. So you come and work for me too. <laughs> and uh, basically, you can be that team right here sometime with people giving you applause. So one more time, a little applause for all these people. Wonderful. Thank you, team. This is Mark Croft, and I'll let him explain. Okay? Oh, dear. Okay. Uh, well, basically, uh, what we're going to do is the usual sh demonstrations that we use in our physics yeah, courses uh, to try and keep the students from falling asleep and falling out of their seats. I remember my father once went to Penn State and said he woke up and the professor was at 90 degrees because he'd fallen out of his sleep, out of his seat and was sleeping on the floor. Uh, so at any rate, uh, the, we found that the students tended to like the demonstrations that would embarrass the professor, uh, better yet humiliate the professor, uh, better yet endanger the professor, and uh, the, the uh, whole ball of wax was if it would hospitalize the professor. Uh, so that's basically why I'm here. I'm, I'm the guy, if anything dangerous has to be done, I'm the guy that's going to do it, because if it doesn't work, people enjoy it the most. <laughs> so at any rate. Uh, We'll start off with uh, Newton's Laws of Physics. Oh, and the uh, first of Newton's Laws of Physics is objects at rest tend to stay at rest. And objects in motion tend to stay at, in motion unless acted upon by an external force. And so here I have some flowers from my wife's garden. Actually, my wife has much better flowers than that. Oh, they're nice. Don't my flowers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, our best silverware. <laughs> and be best dishes. And uh, if I pull it slowly, friction holds. And I can move it close to my face. Uh, but if I pull it very quickly, uh, the static friction should give way to sliding friction, which is very small. And I shouldn't get a face full of plates and have to buy new glasses. <laughs> Of course, next Thanksgiving, all you kids can do the same thing, right? <laughs> uh, you have to have just the right circumstances. Don't try that one at home. Uh, OK, uh, those are objects at, at rest tend to stay at rest. The next one is objects in motion tend to stay in motion. And this is actually very important, because uh, old, poor old Aristotle used to say, well, to keep an object moving, you had to continuously push on it. And anything that isn't acted upon stays at rest. But that's because he didn't have an air-powered hockey puck. <laughs> so an object in motion tends to stay in motion at a constant speed until acted upon by another force. And this is the same law that we just demonstrated. Oh, there's the lights. <laughs> That's the same law that we just demonstrated when we pulled the tablecloth out from under the dishes. Now, the next of Newton's laws is the F equals MA, force equals mass times acceleration. In other words, if you have a very small mass and you exert a force on it, you get a lot of change in speed, which is the acceleration. And so I hit hit this guy, he goes flying off into the front row. And if I hit this guy, boy, this is a piece of wood, he has a little more mass, he won't ch get as high a velocity when hit with the same force. <laughs> I don't usually hit people in the front row. <laughs> and now I have a very heavy mass here. Actually, this is a piece of lead. And I can beat on it with impunity. Its mass is so large, it hardly accelerates at all. As a matter of fact, I can even put my hand under it, and it won't accelerate into my hand. It doesn't hurt at all. <laughs> <laughs> OK, those are Newton's laws. Now, there's one more of Newton's laws. 
It isn't really Newton's laws. Um, he no noticed this, and this is the concept of action at a distance. And one of the best illustrations I know of this is the uh, toy called buzz magnets that you can buy on the internet. Okay, they buzz and they bounce off each other if you throw them up and they hit each other. But if you put one here and you put another one here, <laughs> they attract each other even without touching each other. So it's action at a distance. And then Newton, of course, put this into the uh, laws of planetary motion. Now this one, I just like to do now because, uh, well, this one isn't so good. Uh, these are the elementary solids, the five this regular solids, solid. and I need a laser here. There's my laser. And with mag formers, you can learn to build these on your own very, very quickly. They're good for even the, a young child. Tetrahedron cube, octahedron, dodecahedron, and icosahedron. And here they all are except somebody squashed my dodecahedron. Fortunately, the dodecahedron can be reassembled rather quickly. Okay, so I, th these mag formers are really quite fun, even for very old adults like myself, very old children like myself. <laughs> okay, and, and then Kepler liked these so much that he put them together into a theory of the orbits of the planets, but he was wrong. <laughs> it does. It works by accident. Okay, where are we up to? I'm going to do this one right here. Okay. So, uh, what do I got my hand right there? What is that? Bowling ball. Are bowling balls big and massive? Yeah. Yeah, they are. We know that, right? We've played with bowling balls before. We know they're nice and heavy, right? You hear it hit the table. Now, what is that bowling ball attached to? A string. Is that a big heavy rope? No, that's just a light little string. And if there's anything you get out of our show at all, it's that human beings are scientists all the time. We really are. We're always looking around and checking out how things work. We do this all the time naturally. So as scientists, tell me, can I pick up that heavy bowling ball with that light little string? Do you hear different answers? And that's exactly what scientists do. They're arguing about things all the time, just like we are right here, right? But how do we find out what can happen? What do I got to do? Try it. All I need to do is give this little bowling ball with that string, pull up like that, and you notice I can move that bowling ball right off the surface of that table, right? Now, don't use your phones now. I want you to pay attention to us. At the same time after the show, you go, hey, Siri, What's a jerk? Really? Because a jerk is actually a change in acceleration. And if I'm a jerk up here and I pull really hard on the string, what's going to happen to the string? And you kind of know that because you've done similar things all your life. So you're applying that science to this situation. But think about it this way. Newton's second law. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. The higher the acceleration, the more the force on the string till it can't take it. That's what's happening here right now. Three, two, one, and it breaks every single time. But when do you do this experiment? Never. Never. <laughs> Never. I hope not. Because this right here is the exact same experiment. <laughs> Let me introduce you to toilet paper. <laughs> you want some squares, how do you pull it? Slow. You get enough squares, what do you do? You jerk it. It's the exact same experiment. Do I really have to explain this one? Uh, I'm a little worried about the audience. All right, well, we're going to use the same law. You want to bring out our uh, pan in here? We're actually going to do something. We're going to use atmospheric pressure with force, mass, and acceleration right now. Again, you know, if I go up to you and I ask, how heavy is the air pressing down on your body? What do you know? You don't know because you're always in the air, right? You don't really realize how much force that's actually pressing down on your body all the time. So unless you're an astronaut, you've climbed Everest, you really don't know how much force is on you from air. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to take all the air out, not from the room, just from this thing right here. We've got this long tube right here. I'm going to turn on this pump. It's going to pull all the air out of this really long tube. Now here's our experiment. On one side of this really long tube, right inside here, I have what? What's that? It's a ping pong ball. Ping pong ball is very light, 
fluffy piece of plastic, hardly any mass. On the other side of this really long tube, I have three what? Cans, soda cans. Soda cans are made of what? Metal. I drop it, you hear it at the table, you know that's a metal can. But here's our experiment. I'm now going to take a razor blade. I'm going to pop open the side of the tube right here. Now that all the air has left this tube, the same air pressure that's pressing down on you all the time is going to re-enter the tube on this side. Force is equal to mass times acceleration. The mass of the ping pong ball gets accelerated down the tube. When it leaves this side, that ping pong ball that's in there will be going 700 miles an hour. Yeah. Two things about this. One. It's really, 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 really hard to see the ping pong ball move through the tube. I want you to see if you can see it. Two, it's an extremely loud noise. So if you're scared of loud noise, especially you here in front, please cover your ears, OK? So let's see the force of atmospheric pressure. Three, two, one. What did we do? Let's see the results of our experiment. What do you think we did? That is can number one. Shot through by what? A ping pong ball. Pushed by what? Air. air. Atmospheric pressure. The same force of air that's pressing down on you all the time. Here's can number two, giving birth to a ping pong ball. And uh, these Coke cans are really tough. It never goes through that. No, no, once in a while. But that's the force of atmospheric pressure. Thank you very much. Balloon? No. I think we're up to here, aren't we? No, no, we're doing the uh, human work. Oh, balloon. yes, that's right. You know, there's a third law of motion. What's the third law of motion? Anybody know? For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. For every push, there's an equal and opposite push. Okay? And I can take my two hands and I can press them together really hard like this. There's a lot of force, but you don't see anything moving, right? We've got this pretty red cart right here. And here's what I can do to the red cart. I can push on the surface of the red cart really hard. But it just pushes equally back on me, holding me up. A lot of force down, a lot of force up, but no motion. But this law and rule will give us motion. What is that right here? A balloon. What is it now? A bigger balloon. A balloon filled with what? Air. And we just saw how massive air is. But think of it this way. If I let the balloon go, what happens to the balloon? It goes one way. What does the air do? It goes the other way, which is why you get motion with this law. Every action equal and opposite reaction. Three, two, one, and off it goes. <laughs> but that's not so impressive. Let's try the exact same experiment with this. What's this? A fire extinguisher filled with lots and lots of force. A whole lot of CO2. What I'm now going to do is take all the force in that fire extinguisher. I'm going to hit that sail right there with all that force. It's pointed right at it. And as scientists, I want you to tell me, what direction will my cart then go in? I see hands going everywhere. Remember, there's no grading here today, OK? It's not even pass fail. You can say anything you want. No one will judge you. So let's do a physics survey. Who says I go that way? Me. Be brave. Me. Who says I go that way? Me. Me. Who thinks I'm headed this way? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows I'm going that way? <laughs> Sooner or later, not today, I hope. By the way, this is also an extremely loud noise. If you're scared of loud noises, cover your ears. And it's just like a grenade, you actually pull the pin. So let's see what direction I go in, all right? Physics countdown. Three, two, one. <laughs> Which way did I go? Nowhere. The only thing that happens is your butt gets really cold. That's it. It's right down your pants. Now why? You saw and heard how much force hit the sail, but there was no motion. But of course there wasn't. You don't push on yourself and go into motion. If you're in a skateboard, how do you get the skateboard to move? You push on the ground, right? Push on someone sitting next to you. Do you push on yourself? No. Hey, do rockets have sails? No, rockets don't have sales. Well, how do we make this rocket cart really a rocket cart? Take the sail off of it. And this is why we have Mark. All right? 
Mark's now going to put himself on this cart and he's going to rock it across this room. Hey, let me ask you, before he does this, I got the sail right here. You're going to see all the force hit me. But do I have to be here with the sail for him to go forward? No, no there's nobody in auto space standing behind rockets. So this is a job they gave me, okay? So let's see what our rocket motion in action. Three, two, one. Whoa. Right there. <laughs> Notice, I wore a safety helmet during that. <laughs> this is my old college football helmet. You also notice it has a crack. <laughs> they gave it to me because I cracked it. it explain, they said it explains a lot of my behavior since then. Actually, my old team is in the is in the final four from the national championship this weekend. Okay. Okay. So, oh, I forgot. There was the, yeah, the cracked helmet, remember. <laughs> uh, I used to do that demonstration slightly differently. And you can see that here. When I started doing this demonstration successfully, I did it like this. Turn it that way. You'll notice that I held the fire extinguisher rather strangely. It's not because I'm strange, although I may be strange and nonetheless, but I held it that because I wanted to curl myself around it and have it push in my center of mass. I had learned earlier that if you hold it off to the side like this, I don't just go into translation, but I go into a second room. So is it back? Rotation. And you know how you get older, how your common sense seems to get better and better and better? Well, my common sense sort of went up and then it went dead to zero. Because the first time I did this demonstration, I had an old pair of skates. I was on a rug floor and I had a little fire extinguisher. And nothing happened. And I got so angry, I came back the next time with a 50-pound fire, fire extinguisher. I had a new pair of racing skates, and that was on the way to zero. But dead zero is when I got up on a table that tall so I wouldn't have the friction of the rug. And as I blew myself rotating and translating off the table, I realized that I was at zero in common sense. <laughs> okay. So that's translation. I, I, I have an artificial knee now, and the other one's not so good. I may occasionally do that demonstration, but it'll be pretty rare. Um, now we go to things that go in a circle. And because everything else so far has been sort of traveling in a straight line. And so here I have an object that has a string on it. And you know, a string's a great way to swing something in a circle. I particularly like this because uh, I, I can't push on it. I can't make it go this way. I can't make it go that way. All I can do with the string is pull. Pull towards the hand. Okay? So I now, I wiggle it around a little bit to violate that just a little bit, but I start it going in a circle. And you see as it goes in a circle, I'm always pulling towards the center. So when something's going in a circle, the force po points basically towards the center. And if I let go of it, I get the David and Goliath effect. I don't know. Watch out over there. I, don't, I can't really. I'm not like David. Okay. It, right? We're not ready for that one yet. Okay. Oh, here. Uh, oh yes, of course. <laughs> he the That's yes. what I did. Well, that circular motion demonstration. I say, okay, that's nice, but the professor didn't get embarrassed or anything else. So they cooked up this one. And they like me to do this one too. You know why? Because I'm not very good at it. 
<laughs> You're laughing, you guys in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> you should have worn raincoats. <laughs> okay, well, I'm kind of trying to do the same thing with this. Swing it in a circle. Okay. There's only one problem. I don't know how to stop. Whoa! Oh, I warned you. <laughs> There's still a little in there. And that's for you. Yeah. <laughs> ah! Energy. Yep. Sorry about that. You okay? <laughs> Usually I get the whole glass. <laughs> okay. Now we're going to, up until now we've talked about forces and accelerations and pushing and pulling and things like that. But now we're going to go into another way to think about motion and potential motion. Um, if I have an object, or suppose I take this object and I throw it at you as hard as I can. It could hit you and hurt you. It would it would do damage to you because I gave it some energy of motion that when it hits you goes away and turns into energy of broken noses and things like that. All right, so, so I'm obviously not going to do that. So there's, uh, there's energy of motion, but there's also this other sort of energy that is, uh, has to do with position. Because if I hold this guy way up here, there's no motional energy, but if I drop it from up there, it hits the ground with enough speed that I could maybe crush a peanut or something, so it gets energy of motion. If I hold it less tall, less high, it hits the floor slower. So you convert energy of position, potential energy is what you call it, to energy of motion. And this happens all the time. Now, in the energy of position, the energy of motion, one of the most, ah uh, yes, one of the, you can exchange them back and forth if you create something like a pendulum. Here I take this and I put it up here and it swings down and then it swings up and it swings down and it swings up and so it's all energy of motion at the bottom and it's all energy of position at the top. So it's constantly going back and forth. And of course, I, I was not even in danger at any point recently. So the students are usually falling asleep and getting restless. So I go up here and I, if you look down there, there you'll see a cinder block. So there's lots of energy of position. I let go of it, it changes it to energy of motion and thence into energy of destruction. Okay. Having seen what happens to the cinder block, my students are usually anxious to see the following experiment. Well, I stand up with here, I get with it against my nose, and of course it will swing down, turn to energy of motion go to energy of position on the other end, and then it's going to come back here, and my students always hope it's going to smash my nose. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> I have health insurance, but not glasses insurance. So I'll start with it on my nose, and I don't have to worry about it because when it gets back to the same height, they won't have any speed, I'm not worried. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They're always go. hoping that I <laughs> lean forward a little bit. <laughs> okay, so there's both energy of position and energy of motion, and, uh, and they can exchange back and forth, and I have a couple of illustrations of that here. Let me switch over to HDMI 3, right? And I can go right here. I'll be right out of your way. Let me just show you two other places where they switch back and forth. And I have to wait one second. 
I should have I, I should have had somebody else doing this while I was uh, yes here's one here's a spring and if I put a weight on a spring and I stretch the spring and I let go of it you see it vibrates back and you can't see it <laughs> HDMI 3 oh it did disappear oh, oh it's, it's, over, it's over there it's kind of disappearing oh, way over there for some reason I don't know why how could it have switched back I don't know oh it hasn't gone off of computer I HDMI 3 I think you should just move on oh, yeah. Show them over yeah, yeah 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 we'll just do it see if you guys can figure it out I can do the same thing here's a spring and you can have energy of potential energy of stretching a spring you know you put you do exercises like this you know you can pull a spring and you got to keep pulling on it to stretch it the more you stretch it the more force you have to have on it the, the more energy it has Ooh. if you let go of it and you can go like this and take the chest hairs off your chest uh, if you start with it like this though here's an object and if I give it any sort of a kick it oscillates energy of motion motion at the middle energy of position at the bottom position motion position motion and the character there's a characteristic time for it going back and forth just like there was a characteristic time for the pendulum to go back and forth so if you give anything a kick and it wants to transfer energy back and forth between energy of position and energy of motion it does so with a characteristic time of that system there's a second way i can do it and that is knowing what it likes to vibrate at namely it likes to go one two three suppose i vibrate it at just the rate at which it likes to vibrate then the energy keeps building up one two three four five six <laughs> You see, it very, it, the energy goes in at the same time at just the right rate that it likes to vibrate and its amplitude builds way, way up. So we can do kind of the same thing with this. Right, Mark? You got this right here? I'm going to do this one, okay. I think that's good, yeah. And are we ever going to be able to get to my... I don't know, let me try. Okay. <laughs> this is a system that likes to, ah, that's not bad. Oh, we need the overall... Do that. Go ahead. Yeah, talking. okay. Keep Actually, just go down one on that slide. All right, here is a aluminum rod. And I'm going to hold it at the center. And I'm going to tickle it. And it's going to laugh at just the right frequency it likes to vibrate at. It can't vibrate here because I'm holding it, but it can vibrate at the end. And so it's going to then send sound out to you. And so this is basically a musical instrument. OK. It doesn't vibrate here, but it does vibrate here. You can get to the next slide. No, your computer's frozen. Oh. <laughs> OK. The next one I'll do is. I see my marking point is not there, so I have to measure where I have to hold it on the other side, in the elbow, a little bit beyond the tip of the finger, in the elbow, a little bit beyond the tip of the finger, I hold it here, and now it can't vibrate here, but it can vibrate here, so it will be a shorter wiggle, but it will be a higher frequency, and so let's try it. You see it's higher? Yeah. No, no. Of course, if I, I may have to bring in Dave to do it right. <laughs> I'm putting rosin on my fingers. Keeps 
stringing because the same distance it vibrates, but if I grab it at the middle, I kill it. Okay? Sorry about it. Sorry about how to have Dave do that. No, okay. Worries. Okay, hey, it's the holiday season. And kids, your parents may bring you out to a good restaurant during the holidays, right? So when you sit down at that table, these glasses may be on the table in front of you. But the waiter knows you're too young to have any wine, right? So sooner or later, the waiter's going to come wandering over and take that glass from the table just like that. Don't let this happen. Instead, put your hand at the bottom of that glass just like that. Hold it nice and tight. Take your other fingers, put it right in your dad's water glass just like that. And then go ahead and just stroke the top of that wine glass. And if you do it just right, let's see. Oh, come on, we know what he wants to sing. You can get a nice pretty tone from out of that glass. Just like that. But what's the best part of this experiment? Yeah, you're going to be bugging your parents. <laughs> you're going to say, knock it off. And you say, hey, I'm doing physics. This is going to go on all night long. And who else is going to hear the sound, right? Is the waiter. The waiter's going to go like, what? What is that noise in my restaurant? What's going on? Hey, you can't do that in my restaurant. Right? This is a quiet restaurant. And you say, hey, waiter, I got a question for you. If I take the rest of my dad's water and I fill that wine glass, we hear a higher tone or a lower tone. Maybe lower. Higher. 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 You sound just like the waiter. What are we going to hear? Higher or lower? Lower. It's a lower tone. You know how the density of the water mixes with the density of the wine glass, giving you a lower resonant frequency, OK? So it actually is a lower tone because of all that density. But we can do that in a whole other way right here. What we have inside here is a beaker. And here's what I can do. Let me show you that. I'm going to turn on that right there. You look down in our box, you can see a beaker. And I can make a beaker ring, too, just like that. But you don't see anything happening there. And you shouldn't just believe what I tell you. You should really look for evidence. That's what science is really all about. You want to see evidence of things. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn that light off. I'm going to turn that light on. And now I'm going to turn off all the other lights we have right here. Because when I do this, and now give this more, we should be able to see the walls of that beaker shake. You see it shaking? Yeah. Quite violently. What happens if I give it too much sound energy? Yeah. It will break. Do you want to see that? Yeah! Of course you do. <laughs> Three, two, one. Just like that. That breaks every single time. And now one of your wave pulse, right? Yes. I think your computer was locked No, up. no, it, well, it was um, it was something with the HDMI because the computer was working. By the by the way, the figure I was going to show you before is that when I was holding the the rod right here in the middle, the vibrations are big at the end, but they don't vibrate in the middle. But if I hold it over here, they're the vibrations are zero here, but big here, and so when I grab it at the center, it doesn't wiggle anymore. Okay, so the next one is? That rope slinky, right? We're going to stretch that out? Yep, yep. Take that. So what we have here is a very long rope slinky. And Mark's going to take one side. I'm like a brick wall. He is. I'm going to take the other side. Now. We've got a lot of tension through the slinky right now, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give it a karate chop. I'm going to give it a pulse. But I want you to watch when I give this a pulse. You're going to see that karate chop move all the way over until it gets to that other side. Then it bounces back and comes back to me. That's a traveling wave we have right here. All that energy moves back and forth across, across that slinky. Just like that. Well, we can do that, but we're going to do that in a whole other way at another time. We're going to build some pulses in just a little bit. But I can do the same kind of thing. I can show you a traveling wave in another way. Here's how I can do that. What I have right here is a big garbage can. Right? That's a great big garbage can. What's it have on one side? A hole. A hole. What I have here on the other side is some rubber. And here's what I can do with this garbage can. I can hit it like this. And some of you here in front may actually feel something. OK? I'm not calling any one of you liars. You're not liars. That's not what this is about. You there up and back, did you feel anything? No. 
And if they turned around and they said, look, I felt something, you just have to believe me. You know, that's the way it is. Do you necessarily have to believe them? No. Do you believe what you see on Facebook anymore? No. <laughs> do you believe, believe what people put on Twitter? No. Don't believe that stuff, right? You don't want to do that. In science, you want evidence of things, right? So what we have right here, Will has a candle. Will's going to light that candle. And you know, a lot of science is done by action at a distance. We actually see what's going on from far away. So I can take my garbage can. I can now whoop, blow out the candle. So you now all know something's going on. But did you yet see what's going on? No. And in science and in physics, what we like to do more than anything else is actually see what's happening. So I'm going to put some theatrical fog in my garbage can. Now theatrical fog is this glycerin we heat up. And the glycerin in all your food, they just don't tell you. So don't worry about this. Well, what I'm going to do now was happening every single time I hit this garbage can. You just didn't see it. Close those doors. And this is one of the reasons why I really like science. What's this right here? What is that? What do you say? Smoke ring. Right, and I can aim it. Like that. You want to make one now? Yeah, you want to make one. Now, what's that shape? That's a circle. What is that shape right here? A square. So if I take my garbage can, and I take the square, and I put it right here on the front of the garbage can, what are we going to see now? Squircles. <laughs> no? How about a heart? No. How about a rhombus? A square. Are you curious? Human beings should be curious. That's what we're really, really good at. How do we find out what we're going to see? Try it. And that's how you really learn in life. you got to try things. And it turns out the only stable shape is a smoke ring. Smoke squares are like unicorns. You want them to believe in them, but they don't exist. Just like that. <laughs> now, this is rather interesting because it actually turns out that we can show you a demonstration. Anybody here know what a gravitation wave is? What's a gravitation wave? We saw these here in an experiment here in the United States. When you get two large masses in our universe combining, they shake space-time. We pick it up right here with an experiment we have right here in the United States in two places. But we can actually see what those gravitation waves looks like. Because what I'm going to do is now show you an ellipse. And if I put lots of fog inside that garbage can now, we're going to see just what a gravitation wave looks like. We're now going to do modern physics with a garbage can. Because right there, you see it oscillate? That's exactly the motion of a gravitation wave right there. Like that. <laughs> So go home and make some gravitation waves. OK, those are pulsed waves. <clears throat> now we're going to move on to simple harmonic waves. And the sound that comes to you is coming through vibrations of the air. It vibrates at higher density and lower density. And these are, these are, this is a rope being wiggled. And you see, what's the difference between these two waves? You can leave it here because I'm just going to be able to say that. You can have this. Smaller. The wave, the distance between the peaks is smaller. And that means if you would count as they go by, they go by quicker. And that's a high frequency. That's like eee! I have a great singing voice, don't I? All right? This one, on the other hand, as the peaks go by, they go by much more slowly. So you would call this a low frequency. OK? Now, there's an interesting thing that you can do with waves, and that is if you shoot them down a rope, here's a simulation, resume of a wave being shot down a rope and it reflects off the other end and it comes back. And the blue is moving this way 
and the red is moving this way, but look what happens. The black is the two of them added together, and the big wiggles, the maximums always occur at the same spot, and the zeros, or as physicists would call them, nodes always stay at the same spot. Okay, that's nice in a simulation, but now we can also do it in a, a real experiment because we have a rope and we have one end of it fixed so it can't vibrate and we're going to wiggle this end with a certain frequency and we start off with a low frequency. And we get a special wave that has a zero at this end and a zero at this end and a maximum in the middle. That's the first special wave that fits on the rope condition with the conditions at the end. Since there's a nice maximum in the middle, this is a jump rope wave. It's actually lambda over two, the wavelength divided by two. Okay, now we're going to go up higher in frequency and we get some instability until we get to the second standing wave. No vibrations at this point. Maximum here and maximum there. This is the first one was this one's it's just like plucking a guitar. <laughs> and then we go up higher in frequency. And now there's a zero here, a zero here, and three maximums. This would be Can we go higher? Oh, yeah. I haven't got a free. <laughs> so zero, zero, zero maximums here, okay? So there's only certain natural natural frequencies and waves that will stand on a rope that is battened down at both ends. And that's the basis of all stringed musical instruments. And let me see if I can... Uh, if you'll notice, it was standing waves on the aluminum rod also except instead of having the ends battened down and not able to vibrate, it was the center or some other point that was not able to vibrate. And these are a picture of the first standing waves that you can have on a rope. You fit it in in little pieces. And now Dave is going to show you exciting standing waves. Here's a question. It's a strange question, but I want you to answer it. How big is that sound? What's the word like? How wave big is that sound? Why is that a strange question? How do human beings measure sound? We know if a sound is loud or soft. We don't know if a sound is loud or small. We measure a sound with what? Our ears. You measure an elephant, you don't know if it's loud because you can what? See him. But here in our show, we can actually show you just how large that sound is. Because that's what physics likes to do. It actually likes to show you that. And how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to put some propane in this tube. Put some propane in there and light it. Whoa. Just like that. And now, I'm going to bring it down to a nice, even flame. Nice and small. Anybody on the lights? And uh, what I'm now going to do is put that waveform back inside there. How big that sound is. Thank you. Because that right there is the sound you're listening to. If you can see that sound go through the air to your ears, this is the size of that sound. This is what you would see. Now that's just one tone, right? That's just one sound. But as Mark said, the different sounds have different size waves. So what we can actually do we can actually go ahead and change this sound. So I have one sound here, but I'm going to change that sound to a higher sound, and it's now a smaller wave. I can actually go down, too, and it's now a bigger wave. So now you see the sound you're hearing at the same time. And that's kind of fun, right? You like this one? 
Yeah, but what if I put a song in here instead? What would happen? We would see all the waveforms in that one particular song. And I bet, I know, you all have your favorite songs. I know that. Yes. And guess what? I'm not going to play any one of them. <laughs> Instead, what I'm going to do, I'm going to play a song I think you all know. And you say to me, Dave, how can you know a song we all know? And there actually are, are a few songs we all know. And it's not even Happy Birthday. What song is that? Star Wars, right? And now I'm going to see all the waveforms in that Star Wars theme song. Some are big, some are small, but we're seeing all those waves in a tube of flame, just like that. Hey, that's fun stuff, isn't it? That's how I play my stereo at home. Just like that. I hope you enjoy that one. That's one of my favorite demos of all time. There you go. <laughs> now we're ready for uh, light, right? Yes. So you're ready for this? Sure. And I have to go back to the dark. There you go. No, we'll come back to this. So now we're going to talk about another sort of wave. Uh, it's a sort of wave you can't hear. It's a sort of wave that is a light wave. And uh, a light wave has the property that it always light travels at the speed of light, no matter what, and until it goes into a medium like this. And then it has to slow down because it has to jiggle the atoms inside the material. So it bends when it goes into the material in which it slows down. So here is the light beam. Yeah. Uh, and there you see when it hits the surface, it bends. I'm shooting it from corner to corner, but you see in the, when the material goes in the material, it ends up hitting j just down here. And I can stand to the back and make sure, I don't want to tip it too much. Okay? So this light bends when it goes into a medium that is, slows down the light. By the way, it also reflects off the surface, and so you can see the light reflecting off the surface up there. The next thing is that we want to shine it in so it reflects off the top surface. Let me orient this a little bit. And you notice that you can see the light going up and hitting the top surface and coming down. Can you all see that? Okay, and, but there's also some light over here. You know where that comes from? That's reflecting off this first surface right here. So it comes in, reflects off the surface, goes in, and it has total internal reflection inside of this block of fluorescent material. By the way, this fluorescent material is designed to glow when light hits it, and so if you hit it with ultraviolet light, and the switch is, okay. So it glows very nicely. I actually dumpster dove to get this block of, of glass, okay? The particle physics people were throwing it out, and so I dove in the dumpster and, and hauled it out. I dropped it once since then, so it's smaller than it used to be. <laughs> okay, now let's see. And also, if you have a fluorescent light, sometimes you can also, can you see anything? Yeah. Is my hair a strange color? Is my wife going to be angry at me when I come home tonight? Yeah. <laughs> no. No? No. no? I have to find some, yeah, let's try this one. Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a good one for, for uh, Halloween. Yes, yes, fluorescent materials. Yeah, well, I'll have to save it. <laughs> now, what do we see right here in our camera? What's that right there? Those are two beakers. And you see them because the light reflects off there, right? And it comes back, and we, we basically see things that way, right? And we got a beaker inside a beaker. But what I have right here, 
is a little what we call magic fluid. No, it's just barely vegetable oil. But it turns out that vegetable oil, when you pour it in a beaker, actually is exactly the same index of refraction that you have as the glass. So I'm not, no longer going to be bending light, although you can still see the inside one now, right? But I'm now going to let this pour over and actually fill the second beaker. And when I do that, what happens to the image of the beaker that's inside? It disappears because we're no longer bending the light as it goes through that second beaker. We basically make it disappear just like that. It's still inside, but the light isn't bending anymore, so you can't see it anymore. So that's what we have inside right here. You see things right because the light is bending, reflecting back to you. And we no longer do that with our beakers right here. All right, hope you like that one. Be careful with that one. Don't make things disappear too much, especially with oil. <laughs> there you go. Now do we want to move on to, what do we got? Spectroscopy? Right there, yes. OK. Yes. Two things Steve. I want to show you while we're setting this up. Here's a picture of the night sky. Well, I guess here. I should take this up. By the way, these things are fun. They're especially way good way. for changing diapers with little children. The kids like to see that on the ceiling. And if you look at different stars in the sky, if you go out maybe after this lecture in January or something like that, and you sort of after sundown, you look sort of over there. Right near the east, you will three see, see three stars very close together, and those will be the belt stars of the constellation Orion. And the interesting thing about the constellation Orion is he has his two arms up, and he has his belt stars, and he has a sword here, and he has his two feet here. And if you follow the three belt stars down towards, towards the horizon, you see Sirius. Sirius is the brightest star in the sky also called the dog star. It's, and uh, if you follow it the other way, you see the Ple Pleiades. They call them the seven sisters. Actually, there's only six of them. One of, ran, one of them ran away with a guitar player. <laughs> so at any rate, so it, it, but the really interesting thing is that in this top corner is a really red star. And that's the star Betelgeuse. And he's hot and he's cold. He's a cold star. He has a very low temperature, so he looks more red. Whereas these other stars over here are wh hot white stars, and they look much more blue. Okay? And we'll talk about the Orion, constell the Orion Nebula in a second. Now, are we ready for the... Um, Spectra? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, you have your glasses with you, right? Yeah, glasses we gave you. Yep. They're our gift to you. And when's the last time Rutgers actually gave you something? <laughs> Right. Besides a parking ticket? Besides a parking ticket. <laughs> and first thing we want you to do is look at that light right there with your glasses on. Okay. Do you see the rainbow? Yeah. Now, watch that rainbow. That's a real, that's, that's because it's a hot wire. Now suppose I cool down the wire, watch what happens. Where is it disappearing from? Blue. Blue disappears first. And now it's more red. As you go to lower and lower temperature, it gets more and more red. And if I turned it way down, you'd have to look at it in the infrared. So a very hot object has lots of blue. It looks like a very white color if you happen to see it. But a cooler star or a cooler object looks more reddish. Of course, blacksmiths have known this for centuries and millennia because to beat iron into a certain shape, they know they had to have it be white hot because it had to be high temperature. And if it was cold and just if it was just lower temperature, they wouldn't be able to bend it at all. So it only gets ductile at high temperature. Now, that is a continuous spectrum. Now, the next one, Dave is turning on here. You want the absorption? Or we do you can do, do that? that. Let's do these guys first. Oh, OK. Can you see that? Yeah. What do you see? Yeah, but what's the, uh, you see individual lines. There's some extra reflections off the apparatus. But what's the brightest line you see? Purple. Mm, 
the brightest? The red. That's because that's hydrogen. That is the most famous wine in the universe. That's when you tickle hydrogen, it glows in the red if you heat up a cloud. And so you can tell what the element is of the periodic table just by looking at the light it gives off when you tickle it. What's the next thing what, what we have? The next one is also a famous one. Oh, yeah. You see that? Oh, uh, yeah, the yellow. The, ye the yellow. Yellow orange, but yellow, really. That is the next most famous line in the entire universe. That is the yellow line of helium. 80% of the universe is hydrogen, 20% is helium, and everything else is less than 1%. Okay, so that's helium. So when you look at stars, you can see these. Now, what's the third one here? Should be able to. There we go. Well, maybe I can help you with that one. That's an incandescent, that, that is a uh, fluorescent light bulb, and it has the same colors. And those are the colors that are given off when you tickle mercury. I don't recommend you tickle mercury in person. And also, if you break a bulb like this, you have to be careful. But when you tickle it, those are the colors it gives off. They use a mercury compound. Yes. That's neon, as in the neon signs. So you can tell what atoms are being tickled without ever getting close to them. You can look at these through telescopes and see them all over the universe. Now there's one other thing, the absorption one. What do you see there? A seven. You see just what those glasses do. They take light. Each color of light, they bend it in a different way, right? We, in physics, we dissect light. That's what we like to do. We don't dissect animals. We dissect light. Yeah. It's actually a lot more fun. <laughs> so you can see what you got going on with those glasses with that tower of different colors. Take your heads, go side to side. It's kind of like a bird flying, too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you use those glasses all around your house. Look at all the holiday lights you have in your house. It's actually a whole lot of fun to look at lights at night. Look at a full moon. That's actually rather spectacular in those glasses. But let me see if I can show you just how much fun those glasses can be. Because I'm going to turn that one on. Oh, looks like it's not going to come on for us. Let's see. No, everything is a little bit uh, disconnected, I think. Let's see. Uh, here we go. I can get it to work. I can get it to work. Right to there. Can't get it to work. <laughs> nope. Not this time. Not this time? <laughs> Not okay. This time. I'll we, come back to that in a we, second. We can skip the absorption. Yeah. Maybe. We can okay. But while we still have the lights out, the, I've sort of inter indicated that very high temperature light is very blue, very low temperature light is red. And those are true of the photons, too. If I hit this screen with a very intense laser, you see, actually, because you're looking through your glasses, you see several spots. But you see nothing that stays afterwards. Well, not much anyway. But if I hit it with a blue light, which much, much more energy, and I better, yep. The material gets, the electrons get kicked up out of the atoms and they have to go to find another atom to jump back down in and give off the light. So the blue has higher energy and you can write with it, but the green, the green you can't write with. Okay. Oh yes, of course, there's one special case of this. This is very, very useful, especially as you get older. You can recognize a seat with a hole in it, right? <laughs> yes, that's a glow-in-the-dark toilet seat. <laughs> Very useful as you get old. <laughs> okay. All right. Take your glasses off now, and we're going to change gears right a little bit. And uh, bring that up, and that up, and that up, and that up. There we go. The one they just sinking and floating, right? Some density. 
So we'll take this guy out. Oh, by the, by the way, while Dave's preparing this, I just want to mention, remember that yellow lot. All right. So, is the screen off? Uh, no, we blanked it. Okay. Remember, you wanted everything dark. Yeah. So go back I had a here. black. There yeah. you go. Okay. Remember that yellow line? Is that there? That yellow line was first seen that from helium. It was discovered not on the surface of the Earth. It was at a solar eclipse back in the 1850s when they looked at it with these diffraction grating glasses, something like these glasses, and they saw that yellow line. So helium was actually discovered in the atmosphere of the sun, not on the surface of the Earth. And that's why it's called helium, for helos, the Greek for sun. Okay, so that's the one element of the periodic table. It was discovered in outer space first, the 1850s. So now we're going to do another experiment. We're talking about sinking and floating. What we have right here is water. Anybody here ever take a bath? Yeah, yeah. I know. Me too. I could use one right now. What's this right here? Pepsi. What kind of soda? Pepsi. Regular Pepsi. What's this right here? Pepsi. Diet soda. You ever hold one of these? Do you ever hold one of these? Yeah. So we know water and we know soda. If I take this regular soda and I put it inside that water bath, you can easily tell me then, does it sink or does it flow? Sink. Flow. Wait a second, I thought you knew this. Will that soda sink or flow? Sink. What do we do to find out? Try. That's how you really learn the life. You got to do the experiment. If I put it in the water, it sinks. Diet soda, sink or flow? Flow. Flow. Why? Because the style. What kind of theory is that? What's it going to do? Is there an extra? Is there an extra? They give you the same amount of bubbles. They give you the same amount of soda. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. The white paper. You'll go home and do it, right? Or you want me to do it? Yeah. You're curious now. You really want to know what's going to happen to that soda in the water bath. And that's exactly what a scientist is. A scientist is just a curious human being. That's all we are. And it floats. There's another list. Why? Science is not only about the experiment. Science is about why. What do they sweeten that soda at the bottom of the water bath with? Sugar. sugar. There's actually sugar in that soda. Sometimes it's corn syrup, but in this one it's sugar. They take a lot of sugar to make it very, very sweet. What do they sweeten this one with? Rat poison. I mean aspartame. <laughs> they were looking for rat poison when they came up with aspartame, you realize? What? And what does that make us? Rats. The rats. That's right. And they only need a little bit to make it as sweet as all that sugar. But who here has ever been in a swimming pool? I who here has ever been in a lovely ocean? Me? Where do you feel more of a buoyant force kind of like lifting you up? In the ocean, why? What's in the ocean? Salt, sharks, toilet paper, lots of stuff. So if I go ahead and I pour salt into this water bath, we can actually change the density of the water bath, and that actually brings that soda right to the top like that. Because sinking and floating is all about relative density, OK? Now, what floats in our air? What floats in the air? Clouds, right? Helium. You got a birthday, they give you what? A, a balloon, right? What's in the balloon? Helium. Helium's in that balloon, right? So what we have right over here is a big blue balloon filled with helium. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to pop that helium balloon. Yeah. But I'll warn you when I know people are more scared of popping balloons than almost anything else in life. But before I do that, fun facts about helium. When I pop that blue balloon, actually Mark's going to do it. The helium leaves the balloon, leaves this whole auditorium, goes all the way to the top of the atmosphere, and leaves the Earth. This is all true. Any helium in the air goes off into outer space. This is the truth. Earth's gravity is not strong enough to hold helium to the Earth. So if all that's true, when did human beings first see helium? Where did we first see it? On the sun. He told you that. Fantastic. Thank you, Chris. We first saw helium on the sun. That's why we called it helios. Right? Helios, helium. That's what we have right there. So let's take a look at a popping balloon. You're sure, right? Yeah. Because Mark's now going to light that balloon. 
Yeah. Now there's another gas that floats a whole lot better than helium. We're never, ever, ever going to run out of it. It's really, really cheap. Why don't they give you hydrogen balloons? Why not? They explode. Would you like to see that? Yeah. By the way, this is one of the really loud noises. So we got a blank screen. You guys ready? Yeah. This is a hydrogen balloon. This is chemistry. <laughs> Balloon floating in? Air. Air. What's inside you? Air. Air. What's all around us? Air. But what's inside this drum? Air. Air. And all the air inside the drum is pushing against the air that's outside the drum. But here's what we're going to do we're going to take all the air out of this drum. We're actually going to go ahead and pull the air out. Now, when we do this, something dramatic may now happen to the drum. But we're really not sure when it's going to happen, or how loud it's going to be, or how violent it's going to be. So we really don't know, that's not it, what to tell you about this, except they're ignored for a while. Because now we're going to talk about moving air. Well, uh, did, did, OK, OK. Yeah. Uh, I, th I thought we were oh, going to do. But that's all right. That's you. Go ahead. OK. There's something I want you to think about. Pay no attention to this. <laughs> uh, if you have a, this is a picture of a simulation. And these are gas molecules inside of containers. And uh, one of them is a high temperature. And one of them is a low temperature. And what's the difference between the two? OK. The high, the, big, the high temperature gas, the atoms are moving fast. Okay, they're running around very quick. The low temperature gas, they're moving very slowly. And you can imagine when these hit the walls, they hit the wall and bounce off and push very hard on the wall. So the pressure is pretty big over here. These hit the wall, they barely bounce off, and so the pressure is very low. You've talked about pressure and temperature maybe before, but I would, this is the way I want you to pay no attention to that. Uh, it's going to go boom. Right now what it has is on the outside it has, lot, it has lots of atoms smashing into the outside, pushing in with about 14.7 pounds per square inch. Whereas on the inside we're taking the atoms out so there's no push on the inside. And so sooner or later, it's probably going to go boom. But don't worry about it. <laughs> OK, now we can go on and think about something else. Why don't you start with temperature? Because we're going to skip the moving air for now. OK? Go OK, yeah. OK. Do you move that on over? Since I've given you this background, this is one of my favorite experiments right here. I get a little bit nervous when I think about that drum, but don't you let it bother you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll, have, you'll have to excuse me, I have to go change my underwear. <laughs> what okay. happened? It imploded. All that air pressure around it finally collapsed that strong steel drum. So it can't actually, it can't handle oh all the God, outside the pressure. No longer anything on the inside pushing back. In fact, I can pull this out. You can hear the air go back inside. But it doesn't re-expand, right? It's not going to come back. Once you crush a steel drum, it's really not going to reform at all. So that's what we have right here, a steel drum. But that's also something when we can talk about with temperature that Mark's going to do right now. OK. Here I have liquid nitrogen. By the way, liquid nitrogen is so okay. cold, uh, it's, it's quite dangerous. I'm going to keep my distance from it. I started, wor started working with liquid nitrogen more than 50 years ago, about 50 years ago. Here I have a helium balloon. 
uh, and its gases, by the uh, atoms of the helium are running around and they're pushing out. And if I let go of it, would float up because it's We're less dense than air. But now I'm going to put in the liquid nitrogen, and as I do, the atoms slow down, and they push on the elastic less hard, and so the balloon shrinks. So let's see what happens. The balloon begins to shrink. It gets smaller. It still weighs the same amount, but now it has a smaller volume. That means it's more dense. And eventually I should get to the point, should be about now, that it'll be more dense than air and my helium blown balloon won't float anymore. It falls down. But now it starts warming up and they move faster. The balloon begins to re-expand. <laughs> <laughs> and it floats again. I really like this experiment because it illustrated the, the point I showed you lay, earlier that it's the mo motion of the atoms. Yeah, it's just going to stay up there. Eventually it will come down. I have a couple other things I can do with liquid nitrogen. These are just for the fun of it. Here I have I think we need a bigger glove <laughs> or a smaller professor. There we go. What's that? Carrot. Carrot. That's a hot dog. <laughs> it was so cold that it becomes extremely brittle. A banana? What's that? <laughs> now, I used to not like broccoli, but then my wife started putting garlic in it, and it was so good. <laughs> so, and this is a banana, right? What's that? Banana split. Banana split. <laughs> Don't you make your banana splits that way? Here we have a nice group of flowers, very soft and gentle. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> no, 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 no. This is a non-violent uh, non show. And they get extremely brittle. Brittle as glass. So, so you stay away from liquid nitrogen. It turns soft things into very, very brittle things. But the, the balloon is the interesting part. We're going to skip to this, okay? No, you're right here. Right. Oh, yes. Do I have the doer for it? Yeah. Right yeah, there. right here. Now, liquid nitrogen has the atoms very close to each other. The gaseous phase, it expands a thousand times, maybe. And so if I put some liquid nitrogen in here, it will start to boil, and the gas wants to escape through this hole. And if I stop her the hole, what do I have? I have a liquid nitrogen cannon. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> okay, well, I got one more I guess I could do. <laughs> okay, this always reminds me of my father. Ready for the lights? My father worked in a nitroglycerin like. factory. And when he got the job there, they Step. took him into Wait. his lab and they said, this is your lab. And he says, he looked at it and he says, uh, why does it have three brick walls and a very, very flimsy looking wooden wall on the outside? They said, that's a blowout wall. Because if you make a mistake and there's an explosion, then it blows out the wall, and they just rebuild the wall, and they hire another guy. <laughs> uh, and they keep on going. But of course, if you ever do work with explosives, you want there to be a blowout wall.
because the energy, some of the air, pressure surge and energy, the explosion goes out there instead of saying trapped in the room with you. You don't work at a closed space with any of these things. Now Mark was just working with something that was very low temperature, but really in physics we don't think of temperature as like temperature. We think of temperature as energy. That's how we really see temperature. It's really a measure of energy, right? And low temperature is low energy. High temperature, high energy. But you're all very high temperature. Let me show you how. Because you're actually all glowing in light right now. You're actually all putting out light, as you can see right now. Again, we think of temperature as energy. And you're all very energetic, as we can tell. <laughs> right? Heat. Just like that. Yeah, this is heat. Basically, we're measuring infrared light. You're all giving out infrared light all the time. You just don't know it because you're not sensitive to infrared light, but you're actually glowing all the time. And this is exactly what we're doing here. We're showing you that temperature, that energy with our camera, our clear camera. But now we're going to shift gears. We're going to come on over here. We're actually going to do some electricity and magnetism, and I'm going to turn on our other camera and let Mark look right at that right there. Yeah, you guys have to guide me. I lost my list again. That's okay. Uh, well, start right here. Okay. So this is a, th what this is is a magnet. It has a magnetic field over it. And there's a very interesting that ha thing that happens with magnetic fields. If I shoot charged particles or electrons down a magnetic field into a line, magnetic field line that come out of the top and go like this, they don't get deflected at all. Here I have an old CRT telescope, uh, oscilloscope, and you see the green dot there in the center. That's the electron beam that's being accelerated and hitting the front screen. And if I put this magnet up to the face so that the beam shoots right down the magnetic field line, you see the spot stays right there. I can wiggle it around a little bit, but not much. It basically stays right there. But now I go over here to the side, and this is something you have to do very carefully, and we have it carefully, it's safe. There's high voltages in here. You don't look at, open up the back end of these things so unless you know what you're doing and you make it safe. The magnetic field lines go like this now, and you'll see when I bring the magnetic field lines in, it makes the spot deflect to the side. The charged particles run across the magnetic field and get bent. If I change the direction of the magnetic field, they get bent in the opposite direction. Left and right. Or I can't, depends on who you're, <laughs> which way you're looking at it, okay? And so the charged particles get bent to the side. Now the same thing happens if you have a coil. There's charged particles in here. And if I put a magnet through the coil, the, you will see a changing magnetic field in the coil and a current will run around in a circle. You can make the current flow with a changing magnetic field. And so let me put the magnet in. I put it in one way. That, this is a galvanometer, by the way, that shows you the electrical current and which way it's going. So I put it in, it goes one way. I pull it out, it goes the other way. If I put the other end in or pull it out, it deflects. So it's the changing magnetic field inside of the coil that makes current flow. Of course, you can put it on a paddle wheel and flip it back and forth at a hydroelectric plant and you ge generate flowing electricity. That's how you can generate flowing electricity by putting a, a magnet in a coil at a hydroelectric plant. Now this is the same thing except this one's spectac particularly spectacular. I don't see the magnet on top. I have it right here. Okay, you want to do it? No, no, no. Okay, just right, right. Just, it was connected to the camera. Okay. Uh, this is a neodymium iron bomb magnet. And this is something that adult or child, you stay away from, unless you really know what you're doing, because they can splinter, uh, and if anybody ingests the pieces, they'll chew you up from the inside. So neodymium iron bomb magnets you don't play with, all right?
We keep them under tight control here, but it's a very powerful magnet. And so if I drop it through this piece of copper wire, this is a piece of copper wire from Fermilab. They sent so much current through it that the only way they could keep the wire from mounting was to circulate water through the center. So it had to be a pipe with thick walls to cool it down to keep it from melting. And if I drop this guy in here, the magnetic field hits the first part up here and current flows. And so energy of motion goes into electrical energy. And so it magically, oh, the focus is a little, see how it floats? My knees are getting sore. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so it's a the changing magnetic field creates electrical current, and that energy is taken away from the energy of falling in the Earth's gravitational field, and it floats its way down. Now, there's two other examples of that, or I guess I don't have the inclined plane one. Do it, with this guy. Do it the other way. Which way? This guy here. Yeah. So that was a magnet moving through the metal. But here we have a very long, large, strong magnet, and Mark's now going to put the metal through the magnet. Changing magnetic field, electrical current. So the energy of motion of the object gets converted into electrical energy. It flows in a circle. If I take another object that has the center cut out, what happens? goes faster. Well, maybe imperceptibly because there's still a way for current to flow around the outside. So it's not really all that much faster. But if I have one, and you can't see this, but I can go like this, it's cut alternately from one side and then the other side so that nothing can flow in a circle, then the electrical current can't be generated and it goes through as if the magnet isn't there. <laughs> That's right. This is the Faraday effect, by the way. This one is the, this is called the ring flinger for reasons that will become obvious. Uh, I put an alternating magnetic, alternating electric field in this coil and it makes a magnetic field that constantly flips from up to down and I don't have a piece of metal with me, iron. Oh, no, there is one right there. Oh, yeah. If I put a piece of iron on here and we turn it on, it sticks. We turn it off, it falls off. That's because it's iron. If we put aluminum on there, and here's some aluminum right here, it doesn't fall off, it doesn't stick because aluminum isn't magnetic. But if I put it on here, a constantly changing magnetic field changes this guy into a magnet two, and then the two repel each other, okay? And if I cut a hole in it, no electricity can flow in a circle, so this guy doesn't jump. Actually, I used to invite children up, and I'd, I'd say, here, put this, it's still on. i say, put this on here like this, and I'd give it to them, and then I'd turn it on, and they'd go. <laughs> <laughs> And I'd say, I'll take it by. I said, no, 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 you just put it on like this. Because I'd switch the magnet off, <laughs> the electrical current off. They don't let me do that with children anymore. <laughs> OK, so at any rate, they would notice that this gets warm. And now, if you p cool everything down, the electricity flows more easily, and you get the effect in spades. Whoa! <laughs> it's starting now, it's enough. <laughs> now By the way. We need somebody to join us for our last two, last group of demonstrations. Chris, come on down. You, come on down. Bring them on over. What's your name? Your name is Chris, right? I'm Dave, so good to meet you. What is your name? Layla. Layla, so good to meet you, Layla. Do you two know what you're volunteered for? <laughs> <laughs> the bed of nails. 
<laughs> you never volunteer in a physics show. It's a really bad idea. All right? But don't you too worry. You're not getting anywhere near the nails. That's actually Mark's job, okay? Just step back <laughs> over here. Just listen to us as we talk about it, okay? Mark's going to lie down right here on this bed of nails. <laughs> All right? He's going to put a body right across there. You ready, Mark? No, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm anxious. <laughs> you know, right now we have a second bed of nails. We're gonna put it right down on top of Mark, right here. Bring it on up, and right there. All right. Now my two new assistants are gonna come on up and just step right up. You see where the feet marks are? Right on up, right there. Chris. No dancing. No dancing. Okay. And right uh, on up, uh, up. there uh, you go. Uh, 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 Mark now has two human beings on here. Molly lays between two uh, beds of nails. Uh, 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 right, Mark, you okay down there? Oh, I'm great, yeah. I'm great. But we're going to come on down. Uh, don't you? Uh, right like uh, that. Uh, uh, there you uh, go. A big uh, round of applause for our volunteers. Thank you both so much. All right. Now, Mark, don't get up yet. Don't get oh, up yet. Oh, okay. Let's go, go sleep. Back to your seats. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Now, he's down there. Now, we don't do this because it's magic. I know it looks like magic, but it's really not. It's really physics, okay? So let's take a look at this, because what I have right here is something really similar to Mark. Thin skin filled with hot air. And what I have right here is a whole lot of nails. Think about it this way. Let's say Mark weighs 200 pounds. He lays down on a bed of nail with one nail. How many pounds of force on the one nail? 200. More than enough to drive that nail right through his body. Let's say Mark's bed of nails has 10 nails. How many pounds of force on each nail? 20. More than enough to go right through Mark and kill him. I wish you'd stop Let's saying Let's say our bed of nails has 100 nails. Two. That actually won't go through your skin. You actually need about 12 pounds of force to go through human skin. Hey, I'm a scientist. I did the experiment. It was a bad day. <laughs> but I did find out. So think about it that way. Here we have a whole lot of nails. Will those go through the skin of the balloon? No. <sighs> what do we do to find out? Try it. Try it. Because that's how you really learn in life. Do the experiment. You see, I'm pressing. It still doesn't go through the skin of the balloon. Here we have. Less nails, half as many, doubling the force. Will it go through this time? Do you put maybe on tests? No. It's either yes or no. Yes. That time it did. So, we have one last experiment. We're going to use Mark right here. And uh, first thing we're going to do, we're going to say, hey, what's that say? Bad physics show. We're going to take this sign. We're going to put it right down on Mark like this. And it looks just like a guillotine, right? <laughs> then we're going to take this. No, 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 no. <laughs> then we're going to take a brick, a very large brick. We're going to put it right here on Mark's rock hard abs. <laughs> <laughs> then we're going to take a sledgehammer. <laughs> Here's our experiment. Bed of nails, Mark, brick, sledgehammer. Does Mark live? <laughs> I say we do the experiment and find out. Three, two, one. Break the brick. And Mark is actually perfectly fine. But he does get up slower every year. Right. There you go, Mark. Is he okay? You should have asked that at the beginning of the show. <laughs> now Mark has one last demonstration to show you. And for this, I think he wants the camera turned off. Yeah, we, thank you for joining us if you're watching the streaming.